is EWA Radio, the official podcast of the Education Writers Association, and I'm public editor Emily Richmond. I've got a bit of confession here. When I was getting ready to talk with Alec McGillis of ProPublica about his reporting on the absenteeism crisis for America's students, he dropped another terrific story, this time about school vouchers. So I did what any self-respecting host of an education journalism podcast would do. I stayed up late and got ready to ask him about both of these important topics. Alec McGillis, welcome back to EWA Radio. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Emily. I might not be as bright-eyed and bushy-tailed as I normally am, but I am delighted to have the chance to start and talk with you again. I want to start with the facts on the first story we're going to cover, and that is about the nationwide absenteeism rate, which has come close to doubling to about 28% of students, or roughly three out of every 10 nationwide. What do we know generally about the kids who are skipping? Well, what we know about the kids who are skipping is that they're everywhere. One of the striking things about this terrible trend is that it really is happening all over the place. The absenteeism numbers are, of course, worst in the places where they were not so great before in our big cities. But you're seeing this trend happening even in middle-class suburbs. We also know that it's happening uh, across all ages. So this is not just about high school kids skipping. This is also very much about younger students, elementary age students um, not going to school. So it's just this really striking, very worrisome, near universal trend um, and near doubling of the chronic absenteeism rate. It improved somewhat last year but it's still way above where it was before the pandemic. Your story is set in the outer suburbs of Detroit. Why did you choose that location? I chose them mainly because that is where a company that I wanted to focus on is getting a lot of their work. Um, It's a company called Concentric that has uh, sort of stepped in to fill a void or try to fill the void that's been left by the really kind of near abdication of a national response to this problem. So you've got companies that are being hired now to go looking for the missing kids and Concentric, which is based in Baltimore, is one of these companies. And they've got a lot of contracts in these industrial suburbs of Wayne County. Michigan overall did have the third highest rate of chronic absenteeism in the country in the 21-22 school year, which certainly helped to kind of confirm my choice of these communities as a place to go. But the main reason I went there is because of the company. And doing that reporting, you spent some time with one of their employees, a woman named Shapira Johnson. And her job essentially is to drive around and look for these kids, talk to the families, make contact. But she makes it very clear and the company makes clear that this is not old school truancy officer hauling a kid into truancy court. What is her goal? Her goal really is to to get to the homes of these students who are already missing a lot of days and figure out what's going on. Try to figure out what the problem is, what the obstacle is, and then ideally bring the information back to the school so that the school can act on it. So if it's a transportation problem, if it's a clothing problem, if it's possibly um, student mental health, whatever it might be, that's keeping a kid missing so many days of school. And and yes, she does make very clear that she's not a truancy officer. There's a lot of concern, of course, when parents open the door, a lot of wariness about who's this person standing on our doorstep. And she tries right off the bat to make that distinction. Although there is in Michigan still a truancy law in the books, and there is still the possibility that in an extreme case that a school or a concentric employee could send a letter to court, sort of getting that process rolling. I spent a week shadowing an attendance officer in Las Vegas, and what always sort of stunned me was when we would encounter usually a high schooler who would whip out a cell phone and say, call my parents. They told me I didn't have to go today. You know, these weren't kids going to the mall, to the movies. They simply weren't going to school, and sometimes it was with family approval. What you found, I think, though, is a lot of kids at home with the parents at home because either their jobs have shifted there or there's sort of this now default mindset that that's okay. And that's COVID-19, right? We're talking about the pandemic's impact. 
Oh, completely. I mean, this is what this whole article is at bottom about. It's about the erosion of the norm of going to school that occurred during the pandemic. When you closed schools for a year or more in many of our communities, you saw a real erosion of that expectation, that habit, that routine that we'd built up over generations. That that is just what you do. You go to school. And of course, there have been some kids who didn't. We've had truancy in the past, but when you see the numbers jump like they have in as universal a way as they have, it really suggests that there's been a complete falling away of that expectation. The word I kept hearing when I talked to parents and these outreach workers was comfortable, that there was something about being at home during the pandemic when schools were closed that allowed everyone just to get kind of comfortable. It was simply easier it's easier not to have to get your kid out of bed in the morning, not to have to get them dressed out the door in the cold, in the rain, in the snow, whatever it might be. If they're not feeling so great one day, if they're moody, um, it's just easier not to have to do it. And we kind of gave ourselves all a pass for that, those months or year or more. And it's just been really hard for a lot of households to get back to the basic regimen and rigor that comes with going to school every day. And that's really what we're up against now. How do you rebuild a social norm once you've allowed it to fall away? I think that's a really good point, but I also think in the context of your story, we're talking about parents who it's easier to let the kids stay at home because they're dealing with so many other really pressing pressures that can't be solved that way. For example, you found, as you said, a lot of families where a lack of money for school clothes keeps the kid home, or adequate medical and mental health care for the adults in the house who then can't be present for their children. So how do we solve that? Well, there absolutely are all these different factors, and and I describe them in detail in the piece. Another one I think that comes up a lot is parents who have really difficult work schedules. And, and so the mom I focused on most in the piece works late at night as a security guard at an entertainment venue in downtown Detroit and gets home really late and then sleeps late in the morning. On the day that we found her, she had woken up to get her two of her eight kids up for school, this nine and an 11 year old, but then she had gone back to bed herself. And by the time she woke back up, the kids were still there. They just decided not to go. Um, So you have a lot of situations like that. I do think it's really important, though, that we not simply, it's easier in a way just to ascribe these problems to problems of poverty and stress in households. The fact is, those problems have been with us all along. And we saw a near doubling of the rate of chronic absenteeism in the last couple of years. Something else did happen. It's very much similar to when I've been writing about the huge spike in violence the last few years. Um, Yes, violence grows out of root causes, and those root causes must be dealt with. But when you see the homicide rate go up 30% in a single year, as happened in 2020, there's something else going on. And so I thought it was very important to get all those circumstances of these households into the piece to show what these people's lives are really like, what people are really dealing with. But the fact is that when we have to step back and think, well, what what has really happened here that made this so much worse? um, I think we still come back at the end of the day to the pandemic and the closures. And out of that, of course, there's been a loss and an erosion of trust and confidence in families that schools are a better place for their kid to be during the day either a safer place, a more nurturing place than just hanging around, that they're going to get some value out of it. And how do that's going to take longer to rebuild, right? Absolutely. I mean, I think one of the things that happened, other things that happened during the pandemic, during that remote learning period, is that a lot of parents got a a window into the instruction that their their children were getting. And of course, that was not a very representative window. What was happening in remote learning, you know, on the Zoom screen was not in any way representative of what educators do every day in the classroom. But I think some parents were still sort of um, taken aback or disheartened by what they saw. And so then now they think on any given day, what's the big deal really if my kid misses this? It didn't seem like it really had all that much much value. It seemed pretty pretty boring. It seemed pretty insubstantial, um, seemed pretty rote, whatever it might be. And so they don't see it as, as that big a deal to miss. There's also, of course, the fact that, which you alluded to briefly before, that with so many more parents now able to work at home themselves, you simply don't have the prior incentive of wanting to get your kid to school simply because you need school to provide the super basic supervision for for the day while you're at work. And now that for in some households, that's also fallen away. 
What is the role of a responsible education journalist here? What do I need to tell my editor about this crisis? What are the stories that I should be reporting responsibly to help sound this alarm bell? I would say, first of all, simply to be writing about it, period. And there are certain cities where I've seen just really good day in and out reporting on this problem. I think of actually of Detroit proper, where Chalkbeat's been doing a great job out in the suburbs. I um, was very aware of their coverage in the city, um, and I found it helpful for context. Um, the Washington Post's DC schools reporter has been doing a great job on this as well in the district. Nationally, my sense is that there's been much less attention to it. The national education coverage has been so, so dominated in the last year or so by what I would guess you could generally call sort of culture war issues around book bans and and all the rest of it. But I do think some beat reporters have been doing a great job of it. One particular aspect that I would love to see more um, coverage of, because I came away with it still lacking enough sort of granular sense of how this is playing out in different communities, is how the legal recourse is working in, in places that still have some semblance of it. Um, there's still a, a, quite a few states that do still have some truancy laws in the books that still have some avenue, potential avenue for the extreme cases of chronic absenteeism to sort of end up in some kind of a court, truancy court, juvenile court, family court, whatever it might be. And while there's been a general political shift away from those approaches, they do still exist. Um, Chalkbeat Detroit, you know, has reported on the fact that Michigan still does, in some cases, take away cash benefits from families in these cases. And and it would just be really helpful to have a better understanding state by state, district by district of what's actually going on. It gets very murky. You know, it's really hard to figure out in some cases what's happening to some of these cases, but I would love to have more clarity on that. What were the ground rules for you when you shadowed Shapira Johnson? Yeah, Shapria and Concentric were you know, nice enough to let me tag along on three different visits. And one time we had a photographer along as well, but she was very um, protective of the families of the students and understandably so. And so, you know, basically I was allowed to just tag along and then I would just sort of hang out at the bottom of the steps or out on the porch, whatever it might be, while she was doing her her work. And if there was any question of who this other guy was who was with her, she would just mention that I was a reporter. But I was just trying to keep out of the way as much as I could while still staying in, in earshot of her conversations, ideally, just to get a sense of how she did her work. And then I did circle back to families that seemed to have a particularly representative or compelling um, situation at play and try to just get more um, more information from them, hear more from them about what they were up against. We're talking with reporter Alec McGillis of ProPublica about his new education reporting. Don't miss an episode of EWA Radio. You never have to. You can find us on your favorite podcast app. And don't forget to take a moment to rate us on Apple Podcasts. Your support and feedback are helping us to grow. Alec, I want to turn to your next story, which was about how state-funded school voucher programs are turning into a financial bonanza for private and parochial schools. And your story had some data points which might surprise a few people, and that is that in several states, the majority of families applying for these student subsidies already had their children in a program other than a public school. Can you explain a little bit more about that? Sure. I was very surprised, too, when I when I stumbled on this. This is a story I reported actually when I was going to and from my reporting in Michigan, kind of, you know, two, two birds with one stone. And I caught wind of just how huge the voucher expansion has been in Ohio. Um, Ohio and nine other states now have universal or near universal vouchers. Just in the past year or two, this has happened. And I think it's not, the implications of this is not being fully appreciated. Just what a huge shift this is. Essentially, any family, regardless of income, now qualifies for a voucher or some kind of um, public subsidy for their private school or homeschooling in these 10 states. In Ohio, the vouchers are quite large. They've gone up to about 6,000 for K to eight, 8,000 for high schoolers. The vouchers get somewhat smaller when you go up the income ladder, but even if you're a millionaire, you're still gonna get 
$1,000 a year for your high school kid. And so now there's just been this massive surge in uptake for these vouchers in Ohio. Virtually every private school family in Ohio has applied for a voucher. And this is happening partly with the um, encouragement of of the schools themselves. The private schools themselves are have been sending missives to their families, to their existing, you know, longtime families in their school, urging them to apply for the vouchers. And so the result is that we've, you know, we've thought all along of school vouchers as being this thing that allows students, families from struggling schools to get out into a better school, into, into a private school, and to offer them that choice. That is, of course, always been the big selling point of vouchers, the big argument for them. The reality right now in states like Ohio is that the vast, vast, vast majority of people that are now getting these more universal vouchers are families that are already in private and parochial schools. The pressure that some families are feeling to take advantage of this bonanza, I guess, is substantial. I mean, you wrote about a Catholic school in the Columbus area, which basically told parents, you don't have to apply for this money if you don't want to, but if you don't, it could become more difficult for us to give you regular financial aid directly from the school. And that felt pretty heavy handed and not really charitable. No, it, the pressure is quite heavy. At that school, they were told, in the Columbus suburbs, they were told that if they didn't take the voucher, they would have to meet with the school leadership, with you know, with Father Bob, to have a meeting about their resistance. At the Columbus Jewish Day School, um, anyone getting financial aid from the school was initially required to apply for a voucher. They later rescinded that after some parents protested. At the Catholic school I visited outside Youngstown, there it was just, um, it was basically just a, a demand and expectation, and they ended up getting 100% participation from all their families. The Jewish day school that you mentioned and those parents, what was interesting to me is that these were parents who were really just comforted by the idea that they should take advantage of the voucher money, but at the same time, their parents, like, any other parent who wants what's best for their child and what they saw was best for their child was this private school. So do they have to sacrifice giving their child that opportunity on this principle? As far as I know, the parents who resisted applying for the voucher, you know, still have their children in the school and the school did rescind their demand that they apply for the voucher after the parents protested. Essentially, the parents' sentiment was, I believe the school is best for my my child. One thing I always liked about the school is that it seemed fairly liberal-minded and open-minded and progressive. So I was startled to see the school demanding that we apply for vouchers that have been pushed through a gerrymandered legislature by Republicans. And vouchers, of course, have long been a, a great you know conservative um, goal. And they just found it very discomforting that their school was now pushing the vouchers. These parents felt like it was their decision to send their children to, to private school, to religious private school, to pay extra for that. And they did not want that decision in any way sort of additionally harming the public schools in the community by them taking this voucher money that they felt was inevitably going to come out of public school budgets. Alec, your two stories, student absenteeism and school vouchers. If we're looking for areas of commonality or overlap, where do we start? I see the overlap in the effect of the pandemic school closures. The fact that the school closures gave this huge boost to school voucher proponents who were able to say, look, this public school has left all these families high and dry, abandoned them in these communities where schools were closed for a year or more. And they had no, they were left without any other option. Their kids were not in school, while private and parochial schools in many of these communities stayed open much longer during that period. We can't let this happen again. We need to give parents more of an option if the public schools let them down. And, and that just provided this real opening for voucher proponents to, to make this big push toward being universal or near universal with hundreds of millions of dollars of additional funding in states like Ohio. The kicker to your voucher story, I mean, there's irony, and then there's the kicker to your voucher story. But I want to talk about what happened when you went to try and interview families outside of that Jewish day school and the Catholic school at opposite ends of these Columbus suburbs, because I think it helps to frame what I want to talk about, which is 
how do reporters hold these programs accountable? Where do we find the voices in the data to ask, is this program even really serving students well? So what happened when you went to those schools? Yes, I wanted to talk to as many parents as possible. I, I had the the letters from the parents at the Jewish Day School who from the parents who were resisting this demand, but I wanted to, you know, talk to as many parents as possible. You always want to talk to as many people as you can. So I went to school drop off in the morning and just, you know, stood there in the parking lot, um, approaching SUVs and parents as they dropped off their kids and and my gosh, I was not there for much more than five minutes before, I guess, some parent had mentioned inside the school that there was a reporter out there in the parking lot asking questions. And an administrator, school administrator, came out together with a very heavily armed security officer who I you know, fully assume was there because of the the Gaza war and all the, the fears that that has raised you know, around safety in Jewish spaces here. And so they came out and they told me that I had to leave. And then a very similar thing happened at the Catholic school that afternoon when I went to school pickup, again, hoping just to talk to as many parents as possible. And and again, an administrator came out and said I had to get off the property. And then I was received a follow-up email from the diocesan spokesman um, telling me also that I was not allowed on school grounds. And, you know, it was it was a just a reminder that one of the tricky things in this new era we're in now where you have these vouchers, so much public money going to these institutions, these private and parochial schools, but they are not publicly accountable or beholden in the way that public schools are. And right down to the fact that that you're not allowed on their grounds without imitation. And that raise, does raise all sorts of questions about how do you cover these institutions that are now getting so much public money. So how do we do that, Alec? What stories do we want to see from reporters who are either covering existing vouching programs or ones that are being proposed? What are some of the questions reporters should be asking right now? We do have to keep trying to to reach parents and, and educators at these schools. And it's just going to mean coming out in different avenues. If they're going to throw you off the parking lot, then you come at it through social media or what other ways of, of getting into those school networks. But there are all sorts of questions that are, I think that have to be raised now as these programs become more universal, you know, right down to the whole question of who's going to these schools, who's not, what are the admissions policies like? One of the main arguments for voucher opponents is that school choice, when it comes down to it, so-called school choice is really school choice for the schools themselves. They're the ones who are getting to choose their students and choose who they do and do not want in their schools. And I think that's another important question that that my article didn't get into. For a guy who's not on the education beat and hasn't been on the education beat since the early ops at the Baltimore Sun, you are spending a lot of time on the education beat. What keeps pulling you back? Because I just think it's so important. My general approach in deciding what to write about this last you know decade or so when I've had so much um, you know, wonderful leeway to choose what I want to spend a lot of time digging into. My general approach has been to look for things that are hugely important that aren't getting enough attention. And so for a while that meant, you know, writing about what was going on in the industrial Midwest, um, as far as the, you know, these left behind cities that were really not being, I thought, covered enough by by the national media, sort of leading up to, to the Trump election. It also meant writing a lot about gun violence, um, in the years where I, it seemed like it wasn't getting enough attention in our cities. And then more recently, it's been covering this this crisis in post-pandemic public education in America. I, I, it really does look as if, as if public education is under great threat in all sorts of different ways now, whether it's learning loss or absenteeism or school vouchers. And I just think that that's one of the biggest things happening in this country today. And I'm going to keep writing about it for the time being. Alec McGillis is a reporter for ProPublica focusing on gun violence, economic inequality, and the pandemic-era schools crisis. He's the author of the 2014 biography of Senator Mitch McConnell, The Cynic, and more recently, Fulfillment, America in the Shadow of Amazon. Alec, thank you for always making time for EWA Radio. Thank you. And that wraps up another episode for us. If there's a story or a reporter you want to learn more about, drop us a line at radio at ewa.org. 
The mission of the Education Writers Association is to strengthen the community of education journalists and improve the quality of education coverage. For more than 75 years, EWA has helped reporters get the story right. Have a great week. Take good care of yourselves and thank you for listening. Thank you.